So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depends on where you are in the world. So today, uh, as you can see, we have a very exciting subject. So thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo and Robin, to accept our invitation to, to give uh, this talk today. And uh, But today we are here to attend uh, this talk by Rodrigo Schramm and Robin Dörfler. So uh, Rodrigo is a senior research and software developer at the Impulse Audio Lab. Rodrigo received his PhD in computer science from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul at uh, Porto Alegre, Brazil, in 2015, where he has faculty member until 2019 in the Arts Institute of the Federal University. Between 2013 and 2017, he was visiting fellow research at the Disciplinary Center for Computer Music Research in Plymouth University in UK and at the Center for Digital Music, Queen Mary University, London. In 2016, he was awarded by the Royal Academy of Engineering in UK with the Newton Research Collaboration Program Award. His activities focus on digital signal processing and the development of machine learning techniques for automotive audio and music information retrieval. And Robin Durflet is a senior sound designer at Impulse Audio Lab and has several years of experience researching and designing interactive audio algorithms and sounds, primarily for electric vehicles and the automotive industry. His background consists of a degree in audio engineering and a deep passion for music composition and modern music produ production. In 2018, he has joined Impulse Audio Lab where he is now responsible for projects for several German and international automotive manufacturers, as well as internal innovations and product development. So thank you very much again, Robin and Rodrigo, for uh, accepting our invitation. This is a very exciting subject. So let's uh, hear your presentation. So uh, the floor is, is with you. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I really would like to say many thanks to Professor Hayes for this opportunity. So we we'll talk about, about a bit of research and also our development uh, in this field, which kind of merged uh, AI, computer science, and sound design in a very specific uh, target, which is the automotive industry. And with me here, we have uh, Robin uh, which will kind of share the presentation. And thanks for uh, controlling the slides. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, uh, very uh, short agenda for today. Um, we start talking about introduction and motivation about this subject. Uh, and then we will address uh, the, how we approached the, the dynamic driving songs. So basically we have two different uh, pipelines, I would say, where we, we develop driving sounds and morphing algorithms. And we also addressed uh, how we can predict driving styles. And then based on this, uh, we we control uh, the sound generation. And then of course, we present some results and a, a kind of outlook, and, and then we open to uh, questions and discussion. Uh, so now I think I will hand to Robin, and then I continue later. Thank you. Well, yeah, uh, why driving sound? So the question is basically, what are we talking about in the first place? Driving sounds, what does this mean to, to all of us? Um, it's actually a topic that was that originated by what we would conceive of as driving sounds originally, which might be engine noises or uh, noise pollution on the streets. And in fact, this could also be considered as the origin of this topic. Um, because, of course, we know that these kind of engine sounds, which are mechanically created, have a strong influence on the perception of the vehicle. So the sound characteristics are either more perceived as a performance car, sports car, or something like more convenient and, uh, and a comfortable car. And um, it didn't take long that the automotive industry, of course, realized the marketing potential in these kind of sounds. and. Uh, they figured out different ways and already in the early stages of 
uh, tweaking around with the exhaust pipes. They were blasting more thicker fuel and uh, air mixtures into the exhaust pipes. And even some flaws in the firing sequence of the pistons were patented, patented for um, the inherent sound qualities. So we can see that this topic is actually it's not that recent it's has been on the on the market and in the minds of the manufacturers for a long time but by now things changed of course the the insulation for the vehicle the acoustic insulation is improved and it's got better and better and people who bought a very expensive and premium vehicle with a strong engine they actually also might want to hear this engine in the interior, at least to some extent, like the, the good parts of it. And therefore, the manufacturers thought of ways to enhance the sound, which is in the interior as well as in the exterior by using speakers and by using techniques and, and systems which are dependent on data from the vehicle, such as the engine rotation speed or the torque. And um, they would then analyze the sound, which is already in place, and place harmonics and basically sine tones and all these kind of um, additive effects to the to the engine and to the sound and to enrich the the real characteristics for the interior. And um, all this went along quite well. There were systems developed and um, workflows and all that stuff. However in the last decade basically the electric cars went more popular and popular and since they don't have these characteristics of a uh, strong sound the car manufacturers were challenging or facing different challenges by now and um, this is also where the discussion of driving sounds in the context of sound design entered the the public interest because there were regulations now in place, which are demanding a certain type of sound for the exterior. So people are alerted when a quiet vehicle comes around the corner and uh, they might not be able to pick that up. So there is this, this one component to it, which is just a legal issue that has to be solved. But also on the other hand, of course, in the interior, people were used to, especially in performance cars, to the sound qualities and to the engagement that sort of came out of this. And so now we are talking about driving sounds and we're talking about electric vehicles. And uh, these kind of sounds are artificially designed sounds that play in the vehicle dependent on the torque, on the acceleration, on whatever kind of data is at hand to make sort of an experience for the driver to lead to a more engaged driving even. And um, as we can see here, it's, it is also a strong part of the brand identity. So as we know, performance cars, they sort of have different clients in their, in their minds and as a target group as other cars. And uh, these should be distinguished in some extent. So if the engine can't provide this anymore, especially the sound, uh, you miss the effect on the in the interior and you miss the effect in the exterior and basically the the expression of uh, characteristic of the client of the vehicle. So these two things go go together and also we could argue that there is a son certain sonic information about the state of the vehicle, uh, the KMH which is, it is going or miles per hour depending where you are. Um, so. We, when we think of manual gear shifts, we already have one ear at the RPMs and we know when we're going too high and it's a good good idea to shift gears. Um, with the electric vehicles, you just glimpse on the, and the, the KMH is going up and since most of these cars have quite a good acceleration, uh, it's hard to, to keep in touch with the vehicle and you have to look on the streets, you, you lose the, the sense of just hearing what's going on. Um, so these... In, this is basically the fundament, fundament of why people and uh, manufacturers and everyone thinks about these driving sounds, not only for the exterior, but also for the interior. Um, however, these, these sounds are, of course, designed artificially. So the engine actually doesn't have this kind of a rumbly, dark sound. The uh, revolutions per minute are extremely high with uh, electric vehicles. So 
these kind of sounds are for now not the ones that people find pleasing very high frequent um, noisy sounds and um, so the uh, the manufacturers has to design and come up with some sound which fits the vehicle which fits the brand but also fits the taste that they estimate their client will have and this is a very subjective matter of course so it's it's a great challenge to find that one sound as as we talk about music i'm sure every one of us has a slightly different taste even though there might be some overlap but it's challenging to find that what that one piece that everybody will just like um so this is what we're currently having on the market basically there's manufacturers providing sounds they would have designed in advance they have to live the clients have to live with what they got even though the potential is there to have everything playing back since there is no original reference anymore and uh, this is also the point where we thought of um, experiment experimenting with a sound that can basically adopt to to the driver profile or to the driver style and um, to be able to fluently morph between the sound that might be the right type of sound for this traffic situation for this driving situation for this like preference of the driver and go into a total opposite and if this is the sound that we would be estimated to match the taste um, for now you can understand that these kind of there are similar approaches but uh, these are more related to maybe you know these um, experience modes or some driving modes within vehicles where you have switches that have the same sound but they attenuate or enhance it um, yeah and once we drive around uh, drove around with with people we realized how much influence also the driving sound has on the behavior of the of the driver so there's a strong relationship and it becomes apparent that it's a field of interest to look in what's can we have a sound that always matches is it possible to detect the driver driver's prefer preference according to the driver's style is it very sporty driving very dynamic driving or is it very relaxed driving and what would the sound be that sort of fits the situation as you might be stuck in a traffic jam and you hear all this loud rumble and you would rather turn it off or you have a free road in, in front of you and you want to drive a little bit dynamically and the sound just doesn't carry it that those two situations would be the ones to avoid and to adopt to um, for now in the industry most commonly the techniques of this artificial sound design there are two main categories i'd say and uh, one is is a loop based method where audio files are designed in a way that the start and the end of the sound have a fluent transition so you don't hear any repetitions and or clicks or whatever um and it gets it gives you the feeling of a consistent sound and now you can take a lot of these loops which are designed in whatever software you would like to maybe you use recording so there's all the freedom in the design this is a very good advantage of using this, this technique however when you have this um, sounds done there is really not much way to alter them and or to fluently adopt because the material is already there it's already baked into it and um, another approach of course which is sort of opposital is the procedural method where you would generate everything in real time so this is the everything will be computed there's hardly any samples involved and this brings advantages of uh, being able to really have every in-between state of two states um, because everything is is computed there's nothing already defined and, and put into a loop however it has a lot of computational cost to it and um, you might want to get want to prefer those very stable results in the loop when it comes to the um, homologation of uh, others requirements so this is the law that sort of um, makes it mandatory to have an exterior sound so both methods have advantages and disadvantages I would like to quickly illustrate um, both of these techniques in a very simple fashion so what we can hear now 
is the loop-based approach. And in this scenario, we would actually make a whole driving sound just consisting out of loops. I will drive this for you quickly. And we can see that the, the whole sound is basically those for slots where we implemented loops and uh, they are cascaded over over the torque or and the speed and you can design your sound completely like this there's not much you can change after this of course so once the sound is done it is as it is and um, the only thing we could we could really do is change the sound and swap to a different setting and exchange every loop so this is basically the disadvantage of this technique. However, the advantage would be to be very free in design and very fast. The other approach is totally synthesized. So there's really not a single sample involved in this. And um, this can lead to very complex sounds as well. However, this very, this very um, algorithm can more or less only provide this one category of sounds. In this case, it's a, it's a combustion engine. I will also play this for you. And uh, a big advantage of this is that now we have four different types of settings at the corners of, of these, this algorithm. And, uh, I think really used to have this algorithm more in a sort of four-stroke engine proper type of thing. Um, however, all the in-between states are possible to, to, be, to be displayed here. Nothing without any nothing without changes really abrupt changes and all these these in-between states are also possible since we are adjusting that seems to be to be a sound again. Ruby, uh, when you talk together with the sound you kind of get uh, yeah we cannot understand you talking when you do it together so oh, maybe you could just repeat the last part yeah yeah okay thank you so um was what I was illustrating here is basically um, at all these four corners, we see in this in this uh, little program here, there are different settings. And the top right corner is more like a V8 type of sound. However, the bottom left one is more a chopper and like or basically something that has a maybe two or four stroke engine and um, has this kind of, of um, motorcycle character. Um, what you can do with this right now is going from one stage to the other stage without any steppings, without any swapping. And even though in the middle position, you might even have something which is physically impossible, where we have, we're talking about half a piston or, or an exhaust pipe of a non-existent length or whatever. So the advantage here is, of course, that these systems are very fluent. However, the disadvantage is, is that this system is only able to display this category of sound and we could not come up with something totally different with this just straight away. Um, and of course, if we want to design a system which is on the one hand able to display complex sounds and co completely opposite sounds, and on the other hand, a system which is able to be morphing from one stage to the other stage without any stappings, without any changings of, of uh, audible like swapping a, of a preset or, or exchanging a loop file then um, we can have a hybrid solution for this and uh, the main characteristic is designed in the procedural method so the main driving sound will be done generatively however we use loops to sort of accompany them and uh, as you can guess these kind of loops they won't have extremely uh, sophisticated methods of, of 
exchange because we can only crossfade them, filter them, and do these kind of common techniques to this. So this is uh, our approach to this method for the sound design part to make a system that is able to host, host all this without any, uh, with every step in between. So what we went for is a hybrid solution in this case, which relies on loops as well as on the procedural method. And uh, at this stage, of course, what we're missing is the intelligent bit about it and something that can control all this, those parameters and can uh, perform this morphing. And I would love to give over to Rodrigo for this. Thank you, Robin. And yeah, that was brilliant. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that uh, we could generate different systems or use different systems to generate sound. Uh, and then the question is, of course, these systems, they use several hundred thousand of parameters. And in this case here, we are talking in our system, we are talking about around 6,000 uh, parameters. And and then as, as soon as we have this idea of sound sound concepts, we can have different sounds for more like uh, I mean more like comfort car or a more sporty car. So you can really design different uh, concepts. But and then the question is, can we move or morph or change from one concept to another one in a, a smoothly uh, way? And and that where. It, we start to have issues because, of course, between like a state A and a state B, uh, there is an infinite uh, amount of possibilities of settings for these parameters, and you can reach in in an undesirable state. Um, yeah, and then this where we we design a machine learning. So we, again, we are have having two approaches here. So the first one is how we can morph between the parameters. Okay, so basically, I think this. I hope this figure can help to illustrate it. You could design a model that represents concept A, B, and C. Um, and of course, from A, you could derive, you could expect, uh, like, in, I have just a geometric figure here, like a square or a triangle or a circle. But if you morph or try to get something from like a region where is not uh, is not part of A, B, or C you might end up in a very weird figure because the system uh, will generate like a, a unexpected uh, set of parameters. Uh, and then here is where we were motivated by previous work on Google. Uh, Google has this Magenta project where they uh, designed the DDSP uh, project. Uh, and this is really based on the vari variational autoencoders. And in their system, they do uh, raw audio and to raw audio so they can morph between sounds you could do, like record the flute and then from there morph you can just morph to like a violin or different kind of instrument to voice etc uh, so we were very motivated on, on that kind of approach and here but instead of raw audio we really morph between parameters but the the idea behind it is very similar um, and the, the thing about the variation out encoder is that we can uh, kind of model these uh, distributions for concept A, B, and C, but also we can constrain uh, in, on the decoder phase, we can constrain. Can you just go back one? <laughs> we can constrain uh, the, 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 the entire uh, estimation or uh, the sampling of the, over the latent space that we call here Z. And then we could have, which is that figure that's not a re uh, square rectangle or a triangle, even not a circle, but it's at least is coherent uh, in the next one. So it is this is it, again is not sound, but it's a figure to illustrate that you could morphing between one axis. You could go from, for example, from nine, the, the digit nine in an image to zero, and between or among all the states in between these two extremes, you have a very uh, meaningful uh, representation of those parameters. So that's the concept be behind our model here. Which is, uh, I mean, the model is not new, but the, the way how we approach it is, is something different. So uh, you can go to the next one. So with this model, uh, we can really, again, go from 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 like, for example, concept A to a concept B, and based on the constraints, we we can kind of guarantee that we will not end up in a very weird state that could generate noise or really. Uh, be harmful for our speakers or, or for the driver uh, during the the yeah the, the driving uh, procedure. So um, 
And here, I will not get into details, but the thing is, over the last 10 years, uh, Impulse Solid Lab has a lot of experience design these systems and these parameters. And what I can tell you is that uh, in this process, we can control the reconstruction laws and the re regularization laws based on this expert knowledge. So uh, we force during the training uh, the, the latent space such that we can have a, a kind of continuous uh, and completeness in uh, states for the sound generator, for the parameter generation and then sound generation. Um, you can go to the next one. Uh, I don't have a song here, but we will have an example later. Uh, this is just to illustrate. Uh, it's not easy to see that, but if you look on the top here, we have two halves, left and right, and you can see in this spectrogram that these are two different song concepts. We have A and B, and of course, there is no morphing between them, but you can see that the spectrum is very different from A and B. And then on the bottom, uh, we have a morphing procedure from A to B. And then you can see that it's not just a crossfade between these two, but actually, in fact, the, the spectral content is morphing, it's changing. And you can see that if you look into some of the, the, the beings in this spectrum, you see that some frequencies show up in diff even in different locations because the system is really kind of browsing across this latent space and trying to find parameters that can ge generate a reasonable uh, sound design. Um, yeah. So uh, then, of course, this is the approach that we use to, to morph. So when Robin was showing the 2D plane in the, in the procedural engine, so you can generate sounds, you can move. So it, it, you are morphing between parameters in that way in a very reasonable way, I would say. So that was the first part is how we we uh, we can generate uh, reasonable sound concepts and morph between them. But still, uh, one reason why we want to have this is because we don't want to have static sound design anymore. I mean, we want to extend the, the concept of sound, static sound design. We want to have a, a possibility that we could personalize, personalize a sound design. So people could even train uh, the car to generate a very specific custom sound. Uh, and here where we go into this drive style prediction. So we kind of connect um, the second part of our system or our approach uh, where we predict, we, we, we try to find a driving style. And then from there, we control parameters. And from the parameters, we generate uh, in real time um, yeah, uh, a very custom sound design um yeah so of course how we do that then we have to train another system so we have a, a machine learning system a neural network where uh, we use input data and nowadays cars are like a computer with wheels basically so we have several sensors in the car and then we can extract hundreds of uh, signals from these sensors and of course we can combine with individual preference so user can even get get uh, or give inputs to the system and all this data can use to predict a deriving style um next one yes so uh to start this process we we had to i mean is a data driven approach so we had to 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 create or to generate a data set for training our system so in this case here, again, that was the first attempt. And we know that's very like uh, subjective, but we need we, we, we try to connect the driving style or I mean, for every single different distinct driver, we, we use eight distinct drivers in our uh, experiment here. And um, we connect the driving style with some kind of label. And then we, we start from like the idea of neutral, more like comfortable driving and uh, going to more dynamic, which would be more like sporty, could be aggressive. Again, we know it doesn't matter the, the what is the, the the label behind it, even if it's subjective, but we, we have some, we, we gave some like possibilities for the driver to choose what, what kind of word represent better the driving style. 
And then, of course, we also have some labels for the kind of road. So you could road uh, drive in this in, inside the urban area, or you could go to the countryside, or even here in, in Germany, you have this uh, autobahn where you can drive with, without any speed limit. Uh, and then this kind of environment could be important for us. So we record data, uh, 61 driving sessions, um, is around 500 minutes, and uh, we label. So for that, uh, then was a bit naive from our side. At some point, we just realized, okay, we need a, a, like a system that will sit with the driver, and we we'll, like we we design a system in in the Tesla. So um, it, while we collect the data, we also uh, did a system we will like select uh, or yeah give it like a, a kind of script for the driver and then kind of uh, annotate or put some labels on the recordings. Um, you can go to the next one. Yeah. So just to, to see, so basically we have this scan, usually a car works on, on, with, with this scan bus where we can collect data from different sensors. Uh, and then in this case, just to exemplify, we have this aggressive label and then from, from that point, the recording is labeled as like aggressive. And then the driver was driving aggressively. Again, and then we, we did these recordings for different labels. Uh, we record this in a simple rate of 100 times per second. We collect 120 different signals, features. Um, and we record this, when we build this data set, we record with a, uh, like a, a buffer size of five seconds. So that was very useful for collecting uh, to extract features uh, through a convolutional layer in the network. And then we also use a hook size of one second. So uh, this, just to illustrate this kind of signal, um, we, for example, we can have the speed, but we can also have like the angle in this uh, uh, steering wheel. We can have even a, a lateral acceleration. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, we got like 120. So it's so so many kind of uh, signals and, and information that you can have in the car. Even for example, you could have like how many minutes for the sunset or the sunrise. So it's still it's a very high dimensional uh, input uh, data set, and we had to decrease this to something more reasonable. So we we applied uh, in this case, we applied um, like a grid search method to to just select the 10 top most important features for our uh, system. And of course, this also helped us to, to reduce overfitting because basically we, we don't have much data. Nowadays, when we talk about data-driven methods, deep learning, we need a lot of data. So we still not uh, a lot of data. So decreasing is also ha helps a lot with overfitting. Uh, and at the end, we collect only 10 features, which is speed, wheel rotation, uh, steering speed and angle, acceleration, pedal position, brake, pedal state, torque, axle speed, lateral acceleration, and your rate. Um, so that those features were then uh, used for modeling um, a deep learning model. Um, in this case, we use a recurrent neural network. Um, that was important because, you know, there are still nowadays we have different systems trying to approach similar, you know, like trying to to kind of uh, detect the, the driving style or at least to to see if how dynamic is a driving uh, session. Uh, but in fact, one very important point here, we want to morph between some concepts and we don't want to have uh, a, a like a some concept that kind of every two or three seconds is morphing between one state to another one because this will be really annoying. So we really designed a system, a, a machine learning model that could learn over time and then predict smoothly like uh, the driving style. That was uh, the main uh, like uh, goal with this network. And this is why we, we use a recurrent neural network to have like long-term memory and then to we are able to predict, uh, yeah, and keep like more stable a system. Um, yeah, just to understand, even with in this small network is a multi-head topology. So every single input, like we have 10 inputs here, they, they we, we process as individual channels and then, uh, yeah, we have convolution, we have, um, we, we do the, the, the recurrent, uh, the GRU layer, and then we combine in a dense layer at the end. And this already, even being small is like uh, 
more than 500,000 uh, trainable parameters. So this is also another challenge when we talk about uh, automotive, uh, because even if you can run this in a computer, at some point we need to, to put this running inside the car, and then we have to, to target uh, embedded uh, device. And of course, uh, this is, there are a lot of constraints in there. So another challenge is how we can really decrease the size of this and is still having, uh, having a, a reliable, uh, consistent system. Okay, so and then it's, it's a bit more like about uh, you know we, we do this the the, the the default the standard uh, procedure we train this temporal sequence of set five seconds um, uh, we use cross validation and um, we also have uh, this parameter like we use stochastic gradient uh, batch size of hundred loss function and then and we end up with like accuracy for around seventy six percent. Uh, it's still having overfitting issues, so it's still a problem. Um, but as, again, uh, next slide, please. So um, as you can see in this example here, where we have only two classes, like neutral and dynamic case, so we, uh, we are predicting between these two. And actually, we don't predict the class, but also we are interested in the probability of each prediction. So it even not working 100%, it kind of mimic the real situation in the car. So, for example, if I mean this, just to explain the, the image here, the graph, uh, the plot has the background is the ground truth. When the background is white, um, then this means dynamic. When it's gray, I hope you can see. It. When it's gray, then it's neutral. So, as you can see, around 100 seconds is like very predictable. Is very like dynamic. Uh, neutral, pro, the neutral, neutral probability is almost zero. But as soon we you move, then you have a transition phase, and around 300 seconds is even the the, the, the neural network, the deep learning model, could not even predict properly as before. Uh, but that's not a problem actually, because basically this means that the, the neural network cannot like decide based on the training, so the the model that was trained. But then because we output the probabilities, and and this will kind of derive the parameters for our morphing system. So basically this means that we have like neutral dynamic and the system will morph and you give a sound uh, concept that will be in between of these two uh, concepts, which is something that we really desire. So of course, if it was like upside down, really wrong uh, probability, then this will be a bit annoying. But at the end, even when the network is not really precise, it, it kind of works pretty well here for a few number of classes, of course. And then also this give us like some indication that will be really good to, to work uh, in, in the context of personalization, because even if you cannot generalize for many, many drivers, but if the system can learn for an individual driver, then this is a very good system that is uh, could be used for personalization of some concepts. Yeah, and now, um, I think it's time to to go to a video demo. So, Robin, I will hand to you again, so you can present this. Thank you. <clears throat> so, yeah, when we designed all this, of course, this was, as Rodrigo already mentioned, done in the Tesla Model 3 we have privately and our company. And um, unfortunately, it's not able, we're not able to invite all of you. I mean, I, all of you are invited in, in case you're around to stop by our office, but to make a, a little illustration and a, an example we drove around on the countryside and we were really trying to capture those smooth transitions one thing that is of course missing when you're watching this video is the actual intensity of pedal positions and uh, driving style because you need this physical momentum and you need that uh, perception to be able to really distinguish a progressive and smooth acceleration as opposed to a very heavy and and intended intended one um but i hope when watching this video we can at least uh, experience the sonic morphing qualities and uh, 
as you might get, this system needs some time to adopt because we're basically distinguishing between drivers and morphing a lot of parameters. So it's not the idea that you step on the pedal once and this was a very heavy acceleration and instantly the sound changes. But it needs sort of a little bit of a time span to really adopt, which is actually what it was intended to, to really get the driver profile and the driving situation right. And in this video, we were, of course, driving like we're trying to force the system to do this morph. So once you're, once you're driving around comfortably for an hour, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't hear the dri driving, the dynamic sound. But if you're really pushing the system, it, it can adopt quite qu quickly. So what we could hear, of course, I hope is uh, this very smooth and harmonic cloudy type of sound, which resembles in the more comfortable driving style. And then these continuous morphs over several accelerations where every single ingredient of the sound got a little bit more rumbly. There's more modulation between the ingredients happening. There's just more roughness. And uh, the sonic qualities could change from total opposite A to B with every in-between stage and no um, audible quick swapping. And um, yes, uh, as I mentioned, if you guys are ever around Munich, you're happily invited to have a test drive in the actual vehicle, which is, of course, much more interesting than just watching this tiny video. However, I hope that this was illustrative enough and uh, was interesting for you guys. I think um, at this point, we come to our conclusion and um, from what I already told you, this video basically summarizes what was achievable from the um, sound design side at least. So the system proved to be working in the sense that all these sounds could be displayed and easily morphed between. There were no real undesired states in, in, in the in-between. And once we drove around with our, with people we know, clients, and uh, just experts from the industry, it turned out to be also quite reliable in terms of, um, well, not necessarily matching every taste, but generally the profile sort of what we try to set up. Of course, uh, there is a lot to elaborate on this, and now we are dealing with two sort of opposital sounds. If we look at the variety of, of how many people and how how humanity is we would start with like or we would have a lot more um cases to to be able to morph to and um this is also a, a, a progress of course where the uh, artificial intelligence or the machine can can learn more and predict more and come up with sounds which we didn't even think of 
And uh, so I'll give over to Rodrigo for the conclusion of the uh, driving style prediction. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I think this is a very good point. Uh, we are running in in the, in nowadays we, we have these deep learning models generating generative models that can create even art and uh, and results are fantastic already. And I think this really uh, can be applied directly in our context for sound generator, sound, uh, sound design. And of course, now we are morphing between some concepts, but also we could uh, extend the system to also to generate new uh, artistic aesthetics uh, for the sound concepts or like new, really new sound concepts. Um, but also on, on the driving style prediction, I think for us, a, a, a very important learning was the fact that it, it's really possible to to learn or to 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 find uh, dif distinct uh, driving styles from different uh, drivers, and these can this open avenues like to to extend the system to have a kind of personalization uh, feature in feature in future uh, systems for uh, dynamic driving so on. and. Uh, of course, we still have some challenges and all the systems has a price. So you have to do processing, you have to use memory. And when you talk about how you embed this in the car, then we still need to figure out the, the, the best and the optimal way to, to make this uh, reliable and, and feasible uh, such that they can really run in, in this uh, actual, actual modern cars. I don't think we are far from there, but it's still like... Uh, uh, even improvement uh, or extensions of the system would require a, a close look into what is available in the market, what is available nowadays, what is really possible to implement. Uh, but of course, then the other side is, of course, we don't need to, to, to get uh, stuck on this. We can, in parallel, look for new research and de de develop like a state of the art and, and extend the state of the art. And for sure, at some point, this will be possible to run in in, in uh, different kind of uh, vehicles. Um, yeah, and I think we, we, if you don't have anything else to add, uh, Robin, I would say that we can end our presentation now and, and I will hand to uh, Professor Hayes and then we, can, we are open uh, to questions. So thank you very much, Robin Rodrigo, for this very, very nice presentation. I will include here um, now uh, a view of the people that are attending in person also. So uh, if they want to do uh, any question in person, it can be done by audio. But I have here uh, two questions by, done by Bis Wadip Mikey. So the first one is, uh, it, the question was transmitted by Claudio. So the feature that are used to generate the final model Ego speed uh, wheel rotation are also available in driving simulators? Good question. Yeah, we also have a simulator in house and we have different models. Like uh, the thing is, the car has much more realistic uh, kind of signal. Of course, you can simulate, we can use it. And then in our case, we kind of train a different model for, for the, we train a different model for the simulator because. There are a lot of real, uh, I mean, again, if you can simulate really precise with a good precision, then it would work as well. So it's fine. But usually we we don't have all the features that you can have in the car. Uh, but we do have a, a kind of simplified uh, model for the simulator. I don't know if this really answered the question, but yes, the question is you can use it, but usually the cars have more realistic and much more kind of data. Thank you. So another question by Mighty also. Can this simulator, as Carla, be used to <coughs> enhance to data generation process? Yeah, yes, it can. But then it's always the challenge how um, how reliable is the data, how you design this, this, uh, this simulation. So, but for sure, it is a bit of... Um, it's not chicken egg problem because if you can really extract really nice, uh, there are two problems here. You can design really good uh, 
uh, simulation using like uh, like simulating speed, the, the torque, etc. Then of course you can drive and label it as we did in the, the real car. Uh, the other thing that's not real is beside, I mean, I don't know which kind of simulation you're talking about, but the simulator doesn't give you the, the really physical feeling when you drive the car. So that will change your perception for sure. So that will, I guess, not be exactly the same, but for augmenting data, that will be really nice actually. Thank you. So uh, I see no more questions in the chat for the moment. I don't know if there is any question by the audience in the auditorium of the university, but I have one. Um, so all these generated sounds are available for the people that are inside the car or also outside? This is a good question. So in this case, what we set up is only available for the inside. We could, of course, play it on the outside as well. However, um, usually you'll have to fulfill those law requirements for the exterior sound. And they are very strict. And as long as you don't morph, like if you want to have a system that morphs from one to the other sound, every in-between state must not only be able to be sonically pleasing, but also fulfilling the laws. And this would be a tricky challenge for Rodrigo. <laughs> but I think it's even prohibited to change the sound in the outside for some countries. So in some countries, we might be able. In others, it's just uh, not possible to, to drive around legally with a morphing sound, unfortunately. Okay. This is a nice option. So inside the car, you can have a strong sound, but uh, for the people that are in the street is uh, quite one. That is, yeah, that is true. The, the people who are actually into these kind of loud combustion sounds are not necessarily annoying other people who try to sleep at, at midnight. Um, yeah, these yeah. are advantages of electric vehicles, I guess. So now you can drive uh, during the late night uh, with a nice sound for you, but not for the, the ones that are sleeping. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think one thing is very interesting to, to talk about is uh, because I remember the first time I, I drove the Tesla and I, I was trying to understand what is behind it. And there, I mean, there are a lot of feedback from the car and like, uh, audible feedback like that you receive and you only realize when you change or you I mean in the letter cars you don't have it and the, when you artificially add to the vehicle and it changed the, your experience everything I imagine if you uh, I know you, you buy a Lamborghini and it is electric and it doesn't sound anything I I'm it's it is directly like if you the experience changed totally but then if you put sound back then your, your sport experience will come back. So, of course, it depends the target. It depends the kind of, uh, yeah, is really personal, is, is, is like aesthetic, etc. cetera. It's based also in sound signature. Um, but I think the sound feedback is also important, even for safety. Yeah, that, that was another question that uh, I think it, all these sounds also can be used for, for safety, no? So the... So another question is uh, about the customization of the sound by the driver. Um, the car makers will uh, allow you to customize as you want, or they prefer to have a specific sound for their brand? You no. Know? Very good question and tricky to answer, to be honest, because um, some of these topics are still in, uh, you know, research and. Of course, some things we might know are not, we're not able to tell straight away. However, um, I think research is going in both directions. So it is very apparent that the customization is a big thing right now in, in every sector of technology. And um, people were looking into this already with the sounds they already provided. So as I already mentioned, there are these different type of driving modes that might fit your taste better, but to be able to design something completely freely, you would also have to design a system that can do this. So for the first stage, I would suggest, and I would uh, suppose that 
we're moving from more static designs, selectable, changeable, customizable to the open world of everybody can design whatever he comes up with. And there is some clever system in the back that actually takes whatever the design was, puts it in the algorithm that can actually display the sound and connect to all the can parameters. So the, the car uh, parameters, which are then driving the sounds. And there's a lot of technical complexity involved to just basically draw a picture and you'll get a Hollywood movie out of it. So um, yeah, we'll have a, there's a long way, but um, people are looking into this. Um, yes. <laughs> well, uh, very interesting talk, very interesting subject. Congratulations for you both. And, and thank you again to, to be here today with us. So um, thank you very much again. And um, I hope to see you in person in the near future. Yes. Thank you. I hope the same. And uh, I hope also that uh, you will uh, be the responsible for other events with CAS related to audio and music. You know? We'll talk about this later. But yeah. for th thank you, Reis. Thank you a lot for. Much. for and uh, have a nice weekend. You too. Bye bye. 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 bye.